So, thank you, thank you, thank you. So, uh, and I really appreciate all the attention I get. Also, I have a new haircut. I don't have seen that. It's, uh, it's, my, uh, it's my wife's decision. Nothing to do with it. I never had a hair crisis. And I wondered, I, I, I presumed letting it grow, it would f grow, it would feel like a, like a sheep, you know. But it's not, it's more like when you stroke a goat the wrong way. So it's more like goat hair when it comes out. So if one of you men wants to touch it, you're very welcome later on. Anna and I, we have always loved our church family, and uh, this, this past year we have experienced how great it is to, to be a part of this church family, and uh, how much strength we can draw from it. We have had an incredible hard year, and we could simply not make it without our church family, the bigger one and the one in Copenhagen, and I can tell you that for Anna and myself, the church has made our life more authentic and more human, and it has been and still is an invaluable uh, support. The church, I would, one of, I, I would define one of, uh, one of the definitions on church would be a fellowship that runs towards pain, simply. It's born around the cross, and an authentic church will run towards pain, and we have seen the, the church run towards us. More than ever, we love to be a part of Copenhagen Vineyard and include new people. And tonight, I'd like to point to, to the fa fantastic church family we have and encourage all of us to love and embrace the best version of ourselves. If we bring out the best version of ourselves as a local church family, then we will also be a fantastic attractive community and a shining light in our cities. And I really hope that this message tonight may be relevant for us. I could mention so many other important things about the Nordic Church Fellowship. For instance, the fact that we, ha we are now experiencing more, uh, more people attending the summer camp than ever. I think we've grown, I don't know, 10% or something this year. The Vineyard Nordic Summit has grown. We have seen nine more churches and projects since we since 2015, where we where we uh, agreed upon a vision of planting 20 more churches, growing existing churches, impact our communities, and raising a new generation. A lot of things is going on, and different areas are really growing. It's a really positive development, and we do dream big. As a fellowship in the Nordic, we have progressed in an exciting direction. And uh, yesterday, a few of us sat down with Anna Skagen, and he was praying for us and had a, had a word for us that we are, it's not a matter of we're going to experience growth or not. We, he said, you're going to experience a lot of growth. The question is, how will you prepare for it? And it will also at some times include chaos, but God will raise leaders in our movement. So it was so encouraging. Thank you, Anna Sky. But tonight I'll ta I'd like to focus on the topic of loving and obeying. Very simple. One word from the Bible for tonight. Love the Lord your God, obey his voice. Loving on purpose. In the first part, I would which is about loving, I would like to highlight the role of the church. And in the second part, I'll take the liberty to share Anna and, uh, Anna's and my testimony simply about God has met us and led us personally. So first, about love. In John 13, Jesus is slowly, step by step, saying goodbye to his beloved disciples. And therefore, he's giving them his final and most important instructions. Here they come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know 
that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And tonight, this week, and in the future, I am so convinced that this is also God's specific wish for us as a Nordic church, to love each other like he loved us, and in that way, serve our Nordic cities. It is so simple. In the very early church, this divine love was the hallmark of the Christians. Tertullian, one of the theologians at the time, said about the Christians, notice how they love each other and are ready to die for each other. And today it's believed that this was exactly this authentic love and unity among the first Christians that was the biggest reason for the spreading of Christianity, that the Christians practiced this love more than any other group. It was an intentional church that welcomed everyone, regardless of their background, age, gender, color, morality, history, social status, influence, intelligence, religious background, or any other point of difference. To love as Jesus is to love in an including way without differentiating or showing preference. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So the love Jesus speaks of is more similar to, the, to a command than a feeling. A love that is anchored in the cross rather than in fleeting feelings. Love the Lord your God, obey his voice. That love all started with God saying yes to us, with his invading love from the cross. The love of God has become the invader of our hearts. Therefore, we are not just a church family sent by Christ, but also a church family gathered in Christ. Paul says, so therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us this ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ God making his appeal through us. We pray on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And the background for this incredible transcendent claim was that God in Christ had united two ethnic groups of people, the Jews and the pagans, and the pagans were all the not Jews. Together, these two groups made up the new Christian church family that eat, shared, Worship together as a new single united people. The saying, a new creation can also be translated as a new world or a new humanity. We probably have a hard time imagining the life-changing consequences that message had at that time. The widespread divide which cut deeply into the group's cultural awareness all of a sudden did not count any longer between the Jews and the pagans. To belong to a certain group had all of a sudden lost its meaning. Those believing now belong to a new people, a new humanity. All former definitions of who they were now had to be understood in a brand new light. This was a total new thing. And in verse 16, which, which uh, is before these verses, introduced these verses, have, we've just read, Paul says, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. And with the expression according to the flesh, Greek, katasaka, means after the flesh or ethnic origin. Paul makes it crystal clear that in the new humanity, no one is judged according to their ethnic heritage. 
We no longer know anyone as a Jew or pagan, only as a new people, a new creation. In Galatians, Paul continues this, with this main message. For in Christ you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave or free. There is no male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And he says, for neither circumcision counts for anything, but nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And we find a new, uh, a similar claim in Ephesians, and then I'll stop the Bible verses, <laughs> this last one. By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in the ordinances that he might create in him, here it comes, that he might create in, in himself one new man in place of the two. So making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. A new humanity and a whole new world. The, the wall between Jews and pagans, and there, thereby also the barriers between slavery, gender, and social class were torn apart with the cross and the resurrection. And is it not fantastic that we, as a Nordic church family, have exactly the same message today as vineyard churches? What is it that we can offer together with all the other churches? New wine, Baptist, Pentecostal, what is that we can offer? We can offer new humanity, a new creation. And I would like to on behalf of all of us, invite everyone with a different cultural background, different, different ethnicity, to make yourself at home in our vineyard family. You are welcome in this family. Make yourself at home. Just take a moment to think which Light, the church, the church shines in the city. Where a fellowship, loving on purpose, where the barriers between slavery, social class, and ethnic diversity are removed. We are to be the positive answer to the needs of our cities and for the powers and authorities in heaven, as Paul calls it. We offer a new identity, a new social community. We offer a new belonging and a new bridge building across all social divisions in our society, we have an offer, we have an answer, we have a hope. And our communities need it. In Christ, we are a new humanity. Not that our differences should dissolve, not at all, and be raised, but rather that in the new creation, all barriers or divisions that have been caused because of our differences have now been erased. The wall is removed and the cross surrounds everyone. Paul's message is that two ethnic groups, two cultures, two people's history have been cross-impregnated and a new humanity, a new creation has risen. And as local churches, we are not just a total of multiple individuals. We are a lot more than that. We are a new humanity that together with all the other churches has the opportunity to create new cultures and influence the history of our different countries. In that creation, that new humanity, there's a very different rule of order than the one we used to in our secularized world. I love Bonhoeffer's perspective on the church. Outside the church, which is a new human. Only the old divided human being exists. Christ is a new mankind in the new human beings. Christ is the church. So as an example and carrier of the story of God's kingdom, we present the new mankind's identity in our city. We have become a sign for a bargain, uh, Norshipping, Helsinki, Aalborg, we are the counterpoint to racism. And we have as our task to simply make 
the world more human. Not like a performance. Because it's the very creation and kingdom of God that breaks through as a new reality, a new light reflected by the church family. This is why it ought to be radically different to step inside the door at one of our local churches. This is why our churches are inclusive. What to do with churches that are not inclusive? I could have mentioned many examples from churches all over Nordic countries. But allow me to lift up Rainer Vineyard, which is a fantastic example of this. Helle is sitting there, Carsten. I don't he's putting there, but Helle. And what's your name? Matilde. Matilde. And uh, they started in August. And uh, they have already seen over 100 people visit uh, their, one of their small groups. 80% of those now participating in the church are not familiar with the church, have a church background as such. 40% have different ethnic background. People from Iran, Poland, Syria, and even Sweden. <laughs> even Swedes are welcome. Um, and they are, they are saying a similar thing. When I came to Denmark, I was lonely and afraid, but I've met Jesus and I've become a part of a church family. It has changed my life. I'm no longer afraid. I've got a new life. I have lived under pressure due to fear of God and his laws, but now I've found freedom. And uh, Ari, who sits here, wave Ari, beautiful man. He leads Helsinki Vineyard, and they are interpreting their services into Farsi because we would like to be one community with all our differences, but we will also worship together. How beautiful it is, Ari. And we, can he we, we have already heard more, many stories. We'll hear more, and there, there are so many more exciting stories. Okay, this is the loving part. Now the obeying part. <laughs> There's a clear connection between obeying and loving. Love the Lord your God, obey his voice. Our ability to obey develops when we encounter challenges in life or things we cannot control. When we progress in life positively, it's not that hard. A new friend, an interesting job, falling in love, a child, a grandchild, those things do not necessarily demand obedience, but rather gratitude. Other times, we face overwhelming pain and adversity. These times, it's about accepting reality. Obedience will then teach us to accept and respond to the truth. Obedience is about accepting the realities that we face here and now, and cannot escape. Yet at other times, obedience is about responding to and actually changing the future. Whether I had to accept circumstances or try to change them, God has often challenged me with the question, can you devote yourself to the future I have prepared for you? Can you devote yourself to the future I have prepared for you? And let me ask you the same question tonight. Can you devote yourself to the future God has prepared for you? Maybe God has stirred up some things in you lately that calls for your obedience. Maybe you're struggling. Maybe you have a dream. Maybe you got a word from somebody that points you in a certain direction. Maybe you've been considering a sacrifice to make Maybe God has stirred up some things that calls for your obedience. God often gives me the choice. Will I be obedient toward God's preferred future or do I choose my own preferred future? At that moment, obedience is not an abstract principle but a behavior where we set aside our own interest in order to align ourselves with God's will 
and do what he asks us to do. So as a part of following Jesus, obedience is a critical response at a basic human level. I, don't, I do not only mention this because the Bible is filled with stories about the obedience of following something we tend to overlook in our culture and does, that does not emphasize obedience. I mention this because I'm convinced that the dreams we have in the Nordic, in this family, is closely connected to our obedience towards God. Just like the dreams God has for you are closely connected to your obedience. Like me, you perhaps you have experienced that God often reacts very late to our prayers. That some things have a long response time. That God is always a little too late. No? I will now read one of Jesus' parables that I believe will prepare us for the dreaming big, changing our cities, raising a new generation of leaders. For which of you, Jesus said, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who will see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Let's finish Finnish finish friends and the Vineyard Nordic. Let's finish well. And, and, the fact, and the fact that dreams, it was bad joke. The fact, the fact that dreams will take time to be seen in reality is something I strongly believe that we in the Nordic region should be prepared for. Slow kingdom come. And along the way, God will challenge us with the question, are we obedient enough to finish the work? Are we obedient enough to complete the task? Love the Lord your God and obey his voice. I grew up in a small town, little town, village in the northern part of Denmark. My dad was a, was a pastor in a Baptist church. He's over 80. He still lives his life as a pastor and serves everyone he can. Anna and I, we met each other at high school, gymnasium, sitting in the same class for three years. She fell madly in love with me. <laughs> she thought I had a beautiful neck. <laughs> it's like the only thing she saw. We attended the same class, and Anna, Anna was not used to go to church. So I, I asked her, would, would you like to come and visit my church? And uh, she came along, and after her first visit, I asked her the following the week, the same question, will you, will you go with me to church? And she said, again? Uh, we have been to church many times since, haven't we, Annie? <laughs> and all of a sudden, in that small village church, which was a wonderful church, uh, of, it, was, it felt like a family. That's where I learned from my parents, uh, you know, got an impression of what inclusiveness means. Then this church, this childhood church, uh, uh, had some changes, and uh, there were some difficulties, and, uh, and, and uh, the church had a split, and my father stopped, and I saw that, you know, all the things that follows along, like Thomas said today, where two or three are gathered in his name, there's a conflict between you. And, and it, was, it, was, it was painful. But for me, I had, this was, a, this was a moment for me to think about church. It can be done. It can be done to be a loving family. Inclusive family. So, um, in this time in our lives, we, there was a lot of confusion. I, had, I was more or less on a distance to God. And then a friend invited us and and I to a, to a small Baptist church in the northern part of Denmark. An evangelist was speaking, and we sat there at the bench, and suddenly I received a revelation. The thing is, we were only uh, 20 years old. We just got married, 
uh, some month before, and now we realize that Anna was pregnant. And that's pretty early. We, we didn't have any education or anything. I was terrified. I was terrified. And uh, she'd been, you've, been, you've been pregnant for a few months, and we sat there, and I was so scared. I was just a boy. And, and, uh, and uh, there, sitting on that bench, I suddenly saw like a picture form, like a movie. Or to me, it was a revelation. I sat there on the bench. I saw a picture of Jesus. And he was, from his back, he was uh, bringing forth a small boy. And I, had my, I was in tears. I suddenly saw and realized that this was a gift from Jesus. It was not, you know, an obstacle or as much a challenge. This was a huge gift from, from, from Jesus. And, uh, and after that meeting, I felt God has seen my situation, our situation. After that meeting, we were invited into a, to a, to a drinking coffee in a low ceiling room uh, by the organ player in that little church. And you know what? It was a very, very wild little group of old people drinking coffee eating cake very charismatic high flying and it felt extremely uh, awkward so if sometimes if you feel a little awkward sometimes what's going on here in the new year welcome to i know uh, we felt that and suddenly this evangelist started to sp- uh, praying for other people around the table and uh, and Anna and i we sat there and we knew it's coming our way it's coming our way we can't run or anything and uh, it came our way, and there was an old lady who was speaking very loud in tongues. She was very confused. Suddenly, the evangelist stopped her and said, shut up, he told her. <laughs> it, was, it was really a lot of tension, and we sat there. And then, then he came to us and prayed for us. And you know what he said? Nobody knew that Anna was pregnant besides the two of us, and it couldn't be seen on Anna that she was pregnant. But he said, I bless you and your new coming family. And one hour before that, I sat in the church and God had sp- spoken to me about this wonderful gift, now confirming it. But at the same time, that is the calling of my life. He, then he pointed towards me and said, "And Fleming, you will be obedient, he said. <laughs> and, and I knew that there were some things in my life where I hadn't been really obedient. And, uh, and, and, and I took it as really a, um, hvad hedder det, sådan en formaning. Hvad hedder det? Yeah, like a judgment. And, yeah. <laughs> That's too hard, right? But, 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 uh, but, uh, but then he said to me, he said, if you will be obedient, they'll run streams of living water from you to many people. I was very confused. And in reality, this was my conversion. And this was my original call to follow Jesus. And at the same time, I was really wondering if what I should do with my life. Should I study a little theology or should I tune my guitar? And, uh, and, uh, and I couldn't reach a conclusion at that time. I was really... It was really, uh, you know, you need to find out. I was with the, the young adults today. We need to find a purpose in life, and God has it for us. We need to step out into the dreams, and he'll give us the moments to make a decision. But I couldn't find it. I was considering several, a couple of years, three years, what to do with my life. And then, then one night after I had um, crossed uh, the, uh, my English uh, I've exceeded the deadline for applying to the theological seminary by a week, and they only take students in every third year. I, I lay flat in my bed, and I was crying to God, what do you want me to do? You have to give me a sign. If you, if you want me to do this, our friend, Mayana from high school, whom we talked with spiritual things about, she needs to come to faith in you, Jesus. Two days later, we sat on a cafe, and she confessed faith to Jesus. And here she is. I don't. Maybe they're here tonight. No, no. And uh, to the left, Mayana. 
Scott Hansen, these are our very, very close friends. We love them dearly. She is, a, she is an extremely skilled artist, and he's a professional drama, artistic people, and very, very close friends. A couple of weeks ago, late, we, we, we met, and we've been friends ever since, and, and, uh, and a couple of weeks ago, Ulf called me in a certain situation. He said, Fleming, it wasn't for you. I had not come to Christ either. And... Uh, so these people means a lot to us. They are now uh, following Jesus today, and it's just a, a living testimony for us that uh, we have to be obedient when he calls. Love the Lord and obey his voice. But I, I, is it okay if I show you a picture of my family and then you say yes? Yes. Tom Murphy often does that. He often shows pictures of his family. I've never done this. I've asked people if it would be okay, the pastors could be, to tell a little about our testimony. So here they are. So, uh, and so we got four children and, uh, and two grandchildren, and I'm really proud of them. If you're looking at it, love you, children. Proud of you. And... Uh, and they have wonderful stories. They love each other and are really, really good friends. It's just um, makes a dad and mom proud. And, uh, and actually, Saturday afternoon, I married my, if it comes, one another, one other picture here, my daughter, Ida and Christopher, and uh, in, 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 a, in a forest, and we danced half of night. It was a lot of fun. Uh, and they are as nice as they look. Um, and then, then, a little more than a year ago, we, uh, we, I had a letter from some Christian leaders in Jutland, where I come from originally, saying that this, this, this young guy is moving to Copenhagen from us. Uh, he's a newcomer to Denmark, not lived here for a long time, uh, only for a short time. Will you take care of him as, as a church? And I said... Directly, so of course we'll take care of him as a church. We'll, we'll, we will, of course we can do that. And then God, I think God stirred something in me. And I was beginning to talk to Anna and say, maybe, maybe it's not only the church. Maybe it's us. So we invited him out to ice skating and our youngest son. And we connected very well. And I asked the other, uh, the, our other children, you know, what do you say? Would you think we should invite this young guy to be a part of our family. He hadn't met them yet. He didn't know what they were, what their names were. And uh, considering this, seeking God uh, uh, and hoping that, you know, that, 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 that you know, God wanted this and, you know, we could be blessed even more as a family, uh, I started praying. And one day, this young guy, who had a different name at the time, he texted me back. And he says, said, uh, see you in church or something like that, William. And I thought, William, I haven't heard that name before, only that my first son is called William. And I met him in church, and, uh, and then I said, what's the William thing? I said, ah, I've taken on a Danish name, and that's William. <laughs> and you know what? He said, I've also taken a surname, and that's Peterson. And my name is Peterson as well. So without knowing our children's names, he had taken the name of our oldest son and surname. <laughs> Here he is. And would you stand up? William. <laughs> Love you, William. Uh, so, uh, just to finish this offer and uh, when it comes to obedience things takes time um, so when uh, oh man you, Copenhagen Vineyard close your ears you're going to hate this in 96 I went to National Leaders Conference in Bournemouth I was just met, uh, met the vineyard uh, um, in uh, a year earlier and I was going there I was le we were leading a church in, which was not a vineyard church we were interested to become a vineyard church 
and I went to to uh, uh, to England. And coming a day early, I went to uh, a church in the suburb of London. Arriving very late in the evening, stepping in the door at 8:30 p.m. in this church, and 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 people were prayed for all over. They were even lying on the floor. And this guy approached me and asked, "Can I pray for you?" He didn't know me, and I didn't know him. And I'm a Christian, I'm a pastor. He said, yes, you can pray for me, of course. He prayed half an hour <laughs> and said the same thing, give him more passion for you, Jesus. And, uh, and when he prayed that, I saw the blood coming from Jesus' hands, dripping down on a map of Denmark. I saw his blood was, uh, was dripping on the four major cities of Denmark, Olbo, Aarhus, Odense, and Copenhagen. And uh, it was it was. It was it made an impact. Two days later, I sat and the t- listened to the teaching at the conference by Mike Bickle from Kansas, and suddenly my mind went elsewhere. And I, suddenly, I saw this. Tr- I saw a track of Jesus' blood in a major city that we, as a family, were following until we reached the center of the city, where Jesus was embracing us with an uh, with uh, with his arms as a family. And I knew at that moment. God had called us to leave this wonderful church we loved to go to Copenhagen and plant a church. And I also knew this was about planting more churches. This is more than 10 years, 20 years ago. And uh, when I came home and told Anne, I felt I betrayed the family. We were all doing well. We've just finished decorating a three, uh, in a three-year period, decorating of an old house. and loved it. And then I came and said, I think we should move. We should move to Copenhagen. God has called us to go to Copenhagen. And she said, no. And then two days later, she said, yes, if you'll go, I'll go with you. Let's do it. One and a half year later, we left. When the truck came, I I tell you, Anna was crying. We had a good life. It was obedience uh, because we didn't really want to at the time. We were hillbillies, rednecks. And what should we do in Copenhagen? But it's just been a tremendous joy to see the years since then that church has been planting several places in Denmark. To see, to be allowed, it's such a privilege to work together with so many wonderful people in the church and see how they, uh, in obedience to God's calling, has been going out from a church, planting churches in different areas of Denmark. I think the last year in our church, we have given, we have uh, what do you say, given out? Well, we haven't. We said goodbye, sent, sent a hundred people that were very active in the church. And, and we miss them in the church, but it's, we know it's going to change the country. And I've been, I've been in, it's been awesome to see their obedience towards God, just moving as a family, bringing their children, teams going out, and see the joy, see the pain, and see them being committed to be obedient to what God has called them to do. And so now, these four cities, by the way, all have new vineyard churches. It has all come true. It takes a long time to see the dreams come true. And all along, it calls for our obedience and commitment to the dreams God has given us in the vineyard Nordic, and we will do the same. We are a new We are a new family, and we have something to offer. And God will always, along the way, and the circumstances, will challenge us with the question, are we obedient obedient enough to finish the work? You know, we want to hand over a living, sound, growing church family to this younger generation. Hope God will raise you as leaders and you will plant church and we want to give it all over to you and to, uh, and to, to lead us on. And, and we will plant churches, we will impact our communities. Are we obedient enough to complete the task? Perhaps you're in a situation where God is challenging your obedience. I believe that the dreams God has for you are closely connected to your obedience. Dreams take time, and our obedience is the most important contribution to the fulfillment of his dreams in our lives. 
Love the Lord your God, obey his voice. Can you devote yourself to the future God has prepared for you? 